grow, uh, what, what's going on here and, and all throughout the world. And we are to be lights. We are to let our light, our light shine. Uh, I'm glad to be back. I'm so glad to be back. Um, I had a, a two-week hiatus, and um, I didn't hide very far, um, but I am here now, and listen, I have been waiting, I've been waiting all month to preach with this as my background, <laughs> and now they tell me they're taking it down next week after, after vacation Bible school. I say just leave it up the whole year, right? And just let me, let me preach with that all the time. So I was trying to figure out what do I do, how do I uh, preach from Ephesians 5 and integrate monkeys and giraffes and <laughs> elephants. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. So we'll just get to look at everything today, and I'll figure that out another time. But uh, it has been great to, to have Vacation Bible School. It's been really great to see the kids and, and sing with them and have fun with them. And, uh, and what I love about kids, what I absolutely love about kids is it, it doesn't matter how, how small or how big uh, the crowd is, it doesn't matter who's around, they always choose to use their imagination to be creative and to have fun. They always choose to do that. And I just think, you know, imagine that, that those types of attitudes, just the positivity and the happiness, are the types of attitudes that, that Jesus intended to, for us to have uh, when he talks about things like be like these little children. You know, just to be positive, to be, to be uh, thankful, to uh, always, you know, be people who are just always trying to seek out for the good and do what is right uh, in, in Jesus' name. And I love, I love how children can be so creative, how they can be so imaginative, and, uh, and really at times we've kind of used this phrase before, but like think outside of the box, really just kind of be, be them, be themselves, and not have a care in the world about who, who is looking around you. Uh, one of my favorite things to have done this summer has been to take the interns and Thad out uh, to different places and, uh, and completely make a fool of myself <laughs> at their expense. <laughs> uh, so I embarrass them. It's like, it's, I'm not that much older than any of them, uh, but they, it's like, you know, Papa Todd is out with us and he's trying his best to, to, to embarrass us the most he can. And they do, they've stopped inviting me to go out to eat. <laughs> They, they went to Chick-fil-A last week, and I was like texting them, what are, y'all, what, are we, what are we doing for lunch? And they're like, well, we're already at Chick-fil-A here. Uh, yeah, so I ordered Popeyes. I said, whose chicken's better? But anyways, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun to be able to do that with them and to uh, kind of just, you know, um, it's given me opportunity, too, to just break out be who I am, just be who I am and kind of, uh, you know, um, color outside the lines, if you will. You know, I, I think about that. I want to use that as an illustration this morning, actually. I want to use this idea of, uh, of coloring outside the lines. You know, you've seen, you've seen little uh, colorings by, by little children before. We have plenty of them. I have a whole stack of, of uh, pictures that Laurel has drawn for me. And it's been, it's been really great to see how these pictures have adapted and grown along uh, over the course of her, her four and a half years of life. And, um, and I, I do have some pictures where it was just plain, just computer paper, printer paper, uh, just plain white paper, and she would draw on that, even with like just a little, you know, blue or black ink pen. And she'd just draw, and, and of course her, her drawings on there, she says, you know, this is mommy or daddy, and then we get very concerned because we hope that's not what mommy and daddy really looks like. Uh, but, you know, to her, in her mind, this is who I'm drawing, and she creates what she views as this masterpiece, and, and what it really looks like is just a bunch of scribble. You know, it looks like you made a mistake on your, on your signature, and you just scribbled it out so that you could write it again. Uh, that's what it kind of looks like, right? And we've all seen this before. And uh, as she's grown, we've not just given her the plain pieces of paper to draw in, but we've begun to give her the, the uh, coloring sheets that have the outlines, okay, sort of the parameters, if you will, of where to draw. And it's been, it's been great watching her learn and process even these things as well. And so she'll, um, she'll start out, you know, earlier, about a year ago or two years ago when we started giving these to her, she cared nothing about those lines, 
You know, she cared nothing about those lines at all. And she would just color right, right straight through it. it in, in fact, in her mind, the lines might as well not be there because it, it's just, she's just still doing this whole thing. And even if it's an elephant, she's still like, well, this is daddy. You know, then I get really offended. <laughs> now it really is time for the diet, I guess. Uh, but, but she'll, you know, she'll color right through these lines. She'll color right through these lines and not have a care in the world. But as time has gone on and she's grown and understand the purpose of those lines, she's realized that the lines are, are actually a good thing. You know, there was an illustrator for that, for that coloring sheet. There was an author, if you will. And that illustrator or author created those parameters, created those lines, not as a negative thing, but as a positive thing. Because when you draw inside of those lines, it, uh, it turns out to be a really beautiful, really beautiful image. And now we've heard studies, especially over the last several, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, maybe even more. Uh, we've heard the research and all the research suggests that, hey, if you want really creative, intuitive, imaginative children and you want them to be, you know, the entrepreneurs and the big bosses and different things like that, then let them color outside the lines. You know, don't be so strict on the parameters of the lines. Let them color outside the lines. And essentially what it does is it allows them to put their, imperson, their, their impression, their imprint upon that picture. And I think that's a great thing. I think that's a great thing. I think it's a great idea. But, but when you put your imprint or your impression upon that picture, you sort of take away the original intention that the author had, don't you? You kind of take that away. Now me, I'm, I'm of the type where I like, to, I like, to, I like even clearer instruction. So now there's these games on your phone um, where you can, if you might want to call them a game, I don't know if they're a game, but there are little apps on your phone that you can get where they have coloring um, that, you know, it starts out black and white and you have different colors and they have numbers, you know, 37 is for turquoise green or whatever and, you know, 42 is indigo purple and, you know, you, you press the color and then you match that color with each of the numbers and I'm really good at that because I can match up the numbers and colors and, and, and when you get done, you know, it takes a little while, it takes some diligence, and you get done, and it, it's just this beautifully immaculate masterpiece that you've created with the help of the original author's intention. And, and even for kids, when you take, you know, a picture of an elephant or, or of a monkey or something, even if they color it all pink, you know, if they color a monkey all pink because that's, that is their thing. They think there's a pink monkey out there. I, I didn't go for the pink elephant, if you notice. But the pink, <laughs> the pink monkey, we went with that. Uh, but, you know, you, you, got, you got, even if they color it that way and they draw all within the lines, you know, the, 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 it's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it's beautiful when they, when they really, when they really, bring together this, this image with the intention that the author designed. I think that's an important concept for us to, to learn and understand, right? Important for us to understand. It's not that the lines are bad. It's not that the parameters are, are a negative thing. And it's not that they take away your creativity or they take away from the beauty of the masterpiece. The parameters just kind of highlight and show what the original <laughs> intention was, what it is. And if you want the most beautiful image in that coloring sheet, then you're going to follow the guidelines that are there. The chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, Paul talks all about the fact that we have life in Christ, that he has removed us from death to life. He, he's given us the gospel story, the good news, and praise God that we have the good news that we now can be saved. Many of us sit in this room this morning and we are saved because we, and just like Ron said last week, we have this assurance as we walk in the light, as we let our, let our light shine, we have this assurance that we have a home in heaven. In chapters one through three, Paul talks all about that, all about the idea that we once lived in this life, but because of the gospel story, the good news that Jesus Christ came to save us, that he has removed us from death to life and given us opportunity, given us freedom. And then chapters 4 and 5 and 6, Paul begins to get very practical. And when he gets very practical with us, what he's doing is he's beginning to show us the parameters of the Christian life designed and defined by God. You see, we're going to read something here in a minute in Ephesians chapter 5, and it's, it's going to be, if you're not careful, it's going to seem like like there's a lot of negativity going on. Like there's a lot of focus on the bad. Focusing on, on your bad, on my bad, on the, 
the things that we do that are bad. And we begin, when we begin to look at it with that approach, we begin to look at it and say, oh, hey, hey, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is a situation where I'm going to stand up, kind of put my shoulders back and say, listen, nobody, nobody, not even you, Paul, gets to tell me what I can and cannot do. You know, or even maybe if we don't take it that far, we at least sometimes can take it to the extent of, well, boy, it really doesn't feel good to be beat up, to be reminded of all of these bad things. I don't think that is exactly the intentions of Paul here. I think instead his intentions in Ephesians chapter 5 is just to show us the parameters of, the, of Christian living defined and designed by God. And so, yeah, he's going to talk about not what we can't do, but what we shouldn't do. He's not going to say these things in chapter 4 and chapter 5. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. He's not going to say them so that you can say, okay, this is what I do and this is what I don't do so that I can be saved. He's saying them, as I've said before, that this is what I do and this is what I don't do because I am saved. Because God has given us salvation. You remember, he already talked about that in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. You have been saved by grace through faith. And now with that, with that salvation, you do good works because that was the original, that was the original intention of the author of creation for us to do good works for his glory. And part of doing good works is being reminded of the parameters that we ought not to go outside of. Don't get me wrong, you know, when it comes to just sort of the fleshly things, the mentality, creativeness, imagination, we absolutely should go outside the lines. Think outside the box. Become the, the creators that God intended us to be. But when it comes to our own salvation and to Christian living, we stay right within those parameters. And the reason we do is because it's not God's intention for us to put our imprint upon our salvation, but for, for him to put his imprint on it. When it comes to my life, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, I hope you're aware that the commitment you made, the cost that you counted, was that it's no longer your life to give. It's no longer your life to live, but it's, it's God's. It's Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul talks about in Galatians, right? He says, it's no longer I who live. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And not just in me, but through me. So yes, we're filled with the Spirit, but Spirit living looks like something. We're going to talk more about that next week, but this week what I want to talk about are the parameters that God has laid in store for us. Parameters that aren't negative in themselves, but they're wholly positive and praiseworthy to say, I thank God that He's given me these parameters so that I know what it looks like to live like and walk like and talk like Jesus Christ. So I want you to, uh, we'll take three points from this morning's lesson. I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5 and see what he has to say. Verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The first thing that we need to do if we want to, if we want to walk in the light, if we, want to, if we want to live within those parameters that God has defined for us, the first thing that we do is selflessly love. Selflessly love and walk in love. You know, I mentioned a minute ago that, that when we gave our lives to Christ, we, we said it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You know, what that means is that when it comes to service and sacrifice, we don't think of ourselves first, but we think of others first. What that means is when it comes to service and sacrifice, we don't say things like, oh, do I have time or don't I have time? Instead, we need to reevaluate and think to ourselves, am I willing to give this time up? Because the idea is, is when we give our lives to Christ, it's not about our time anymore because our time is not our time, it's, it's his time. And our lives ought to be about always glorifying God, always serving and sacrificing in the name of Jesus Christ. And no matter how far that takes us, no matter how far we have to go with that, no matter how many sacrifices we have to make, our lives should always point to Christ. It should always be to selflessly love. So that means our time, our resources, our money, it's not ours anymore. It belongs to God. 
It belongs to his kingdom. It belongs to his church. It belongs to him. And so it's not a matter of do I have or don't I have. It's a matter of will I or will I not. And the true Christ follower says, as long as I can glorify God, I will always do what I can do to serve and sacrifice. And here's the, here's the, here's the truth of it. You know, I've heard, I've not, I've not heard this here, but I've, I've heard this growing up, that there's been some who have said things like, well, I have put my time in. I've checked it off the list. I've, I've done my Christian duty. I'm now retiring from that. I want to share with us this something this morning. You, you never, ever retire from being a Christian. You never retire from service and sacrifice in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, as long as I can, I will do this until I breathe no more. Now, I don't know if that means that I'm going to be preaching. You know, I don't know if that means that I'm going to be, you know, whatever the case might be, I will do something. Whatever I can do, I will always do. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to do that to point to myself and say, hey, look at me. What I'm trying to say is, is I want my life to matter for the kingdom of Christ. And that should be our aim, our goal as Christ followers. When we walk in love, if we want to walk in love just as Christ walked in love, then we have to be willing to sacrifice ourselves. This is Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? to sacrifice ourselves daily, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, to give of ourselves to, to God. And that is the only fragrant offering to him, that we walk in love just as Christ walked in love. But we don't just selflessly love. We also, we also sacredly live. We live sacred lives. Verse 3 says, and, and I want you, as we read this, I want you not to focus on it from the negative perspective, but the positive perspective. If nothing else, say this, praise God that I no longer live that life. Or, or how about this? Thank God that I no longer have to live that life. I don't have to be trapped because we're going to read some things that while on the surface... You may, you may perform or act out or behave in some of these ways, and they may bring you just immediate pleasure, but eternally they won't bring, bring you any pleasure. There's no good that will come from these things when they're taken advantage of and manipulated away from the, the proper use that God has intended them for. You understand as we read here, verse 3, Paul dives right in. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, now we'll just pause right there. Don't read any further. I just want to, I want to focus on the negative real quick. You know, Paul points out all of these negative things. That the, not, not negative things as in like I want to do them and I can't do them anymore, but things that we shouldn't even have, we shouldn't even have anything to do with. He points out things like sexual immorality. I mean, he hops right into this. If you remember, I talked about the three gods that have ruled, ruled the world from the very beginning. False gods, right? Do you remember what they were? Money, power, and sex. You know, all of those things are not bad things in of themselves. They're bad whenever we manipulate them and divert them away from God's original intent. Did you know that sex is good? It is an absolute good gift from God. But he defines in what way is it, it is good. You know, our culture has convoluted whatever love is, and it's definitely convoluted whatever, uh, whatever the definition of sexual immorality is. You know, we've come to a place, to a point now in our lives where we even say, oh, sexual immorality? Well, well one, this, first of all, this is extremely uncomfortable for us to talk about, right? I mean, I'm uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. We're just all going to get right through it, though. Is Paul intended for us to understand We've come to a place now in our culture where we try to redefine what is good and evil when it comes to sex, what is right and what is wrong, instead of, instead of going back to Scripture and looking at what God's original intention was. And we've tried to say, well, this is okay, but that's not okay, and as long as it goes to this limit, it's fine. You know, that's when you cut it off, and it's okay. We like to flirt with this line of temptation and sin. That's not what we're supposed to do. If we want to define sexual immorality, it's as simple as this. It's any act or thought or behavior, any sexual act, thought, or behavior that happens 
outside the confines of one God created man and God created female in marriage. One God created man and God created female in marriage. One male, one female in marriage. If any sexual act, thought, or behavior happens outside of that relationship, it is sexual immorality. That's God's definition. That's not Todd's definition. That's the Bible's definition. That is God's word. And Paul goes on and he even gets progress, he, he progresses with what happens whenever you begin to think of sexual immorality. And so he says here, sexual immorality, you shouldn't have those things even named among you. And then he says impurity. What happens when you're sexually immoral? You become impure. But impurity can even reach further limits, can it? And then he talks about covetousness. What is, what is sexual immorality? It's, it's, oh, I, it's, it's, it's a desire to have something you can't have. I hope there's you know, no macho men out there. I can have whatever I want. You know, that's not the point, right? That's not the point. It's not a matter of I can have whatever I want. It's a matter of it's not what you're supposed to have. It's not the definition of God that God has provided and given for us. And so Paul here says, listen, one can lead to the other, but covetousness also goes a step further as well. This is idolatry. Where, where does the center of your heart, where, where, does, where does the center of your heart lie? Where is your focus at? Where is your main priority? Is it on God or is it on something that you want that you see your neighbor has? Or is it somebody that you want? Or is it on something that you want? You see, we, we've tried, to, we've tried to, to redefine good versus evil. We've tried to, to redefine what is right and what is wrong. And, and Paul says, that's not the way. That's not the parameter that God has set for you. He says, no, no foolish talk, no filthiness, no crude joking. Maybe this one hits a little bit closer to home. Maybe for some of us, this one's a little bit more difficult to do. You know, he's not just talking about cursing. You know, Colossians, Paul talks about that in Colossians pretty emphatically. I mean, not pretty emphatically. He absolutely says, do not do this. You know, cursing is not, not a holy, righteous thing to do. But then also foolish talk and crude joking. What does that mean? It's, it's, it's speech that tears other people's down. It's, it's laughter coming at the expense of somebody else. Whether they're there or they're not, it's not right. It's not within the parameters of, of God's Christian living guideline, right? Crude joking, foolish talk, it's not there. And so, and so instead, he gives us the recipe for what we should think about and talk about. He says, but instead, you should do what? Let there be thanksgiving. And everything in your life, don't give in to idolatry and covetousness and sexual immorality, but be thankful for what you have. Be thankful. I'm thankful I have my wife. I'm thankful I have my home. I'm thankful I have my church family. Focus on the things that you're thankful for, not just on November 1st through Thanksgiving night, but every day of the year, focus on what you're thankful for. Every day is Thanksgiving for the Christian. Every single day is Thanksgiving for the Christian. And so what Paul is essentially saying is, listen, I want your speech to not be the type of speech that spews and, 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 and tears people down. I don't want your speech to be life-taking. I want your speech to be life-giving. That's what, that's what he's, trying to, he's trying to get across to us here. I want your speech to be life-giving. And so we live sacredly. Verse eight, he, or verse five, he says, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, they, they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And Paul here is not trying to, this, today we might say, Paul, you're being so judgmental. Stop taking away my liberties. You know, when it comes to freedom, here's the thing. We've heard this, I've heard this personally. I've heard this a lot lately uh, over the last several years here. Uh, the idea of freedom. And we hear it a lot around the 4th of July. We hear it a lot around Memorial Day and, and Veterans Day even. And we hear it a lot even, even during election cycles and different things like that. Here's the idea. Freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. And it's the idea that we have all of these freedoms, but they come at some cost. And you know the freedom we have in Christ came at the cost of Christ? That's the only way, that's the only way that we have liberty and freedom in Christ. And here's the thing about freedom as well. 
You can't have freedom without some sort of parameters. What, what do I mean by that? You know, my little child, my, my little daughter, if, if I, if, uh, you know, she is free to roam around our house wherever she wants to go. She's free to roam around our whole house. But you know, I don't leave the scissors laying out on the table where she can reach them. I don't leave medication exposed where she can get to it. I create parameters so that she can't access certain rooms, certain drawers, certain locations. Does that mean I'm taking away her freedom? In our culture today, it might, it might seem that way. Our culture today might define it and say, you're taking away my liberties. You're taking away my freedoms. But you know what that culture is focused on? Me. It's focused on yourself. It's not selfless, it's selfish. You know why I hide the scissors and hide the medication and lock the doors? Not because I don't want her to have freedom, but because I want her to have more freedom. And the only way she can have more freedom is if she has life to have that freedom. And if those things were exposed, it would take away our freedom because there's a potential she wouldn't have life anymore. Or at least it would threaten that life. And God has said, listen, I want you to have life and have life more abundantly. And we've defined life more abundantly. We've defined life more abundantly as, as stuff, cars, houses, money. You know, we want to swim in that big pile of green stuff, right? You know, and that's, that's the way we've defined life more abundantly. But God's defined life more abundantly in this way, having joyfulness. How about this? You go through a tragedy, but you can find joy in the midst of the tragedy, not because you're joyful about what happened, but you're joyful because you know at the end who has you and who you have. You're joyful because you know that even through those sufferings, you are God's and God is yours. That's life and life more abundantly. Now, I don't have to worry about death because I can die in this life and God will bring me home with him. That's life and life more abundantly defined by God. And so he says here, listen, these people, they don't have the kingdom of God. I'm not telling you that as, an, as a downer. I'm just telling you because I want you to have the kingdom of God. I want you to have that. I want you to praise God for what he's given you. I want you to be able to take joy in knowing that you have assurance of your salvation, but live like you do. Live like you do inside the parameters of Christian living. He goes on in verse eight. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, um, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of this disobedience. They're not, therefore, do not be partakers with them. For at one time you, went, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. We'll, we'll just pause right there real quick. Let no one deceive you with empty words. During this time, what was happening was that there were those who said, listen, you now, this is what Paul talks about in Romans as well. You now have freedom in Christ. You've been saved by grace through faith. Live however you want to live. There were those teaching that then. And there's some teaching that today even. And Paul says, don't be deceived by those empty words. You know, the, the, the fruit cake, cotton candy, uh, feel good is not always what we need in order to live for Christ. Sometimes we have to have our toes stepped on. Sometimes we have to learn that we can't live the life that we once lived if we want to live for Christ. And so he says, don't, don't be deceived by these things. But instead, praise God that you've been removed from that. And what does Paul say in Romans chapter 6? You want to keep on living that life? Why? The people uttered. Because God's grace is so big. It's so great. It covers a multitude. Paul says, well then, should you go on sinning so that grace can abound? Now, a preacher one time read that. I was sitting in the crowd. A preacher one time read that. He said, we should go on singing so that grace may abound. Absolutely not. I'm thinking, what? what is that? What is that? You know, step down. Let me step up there real quick. Absolutely not, right? Absolutely. I mean, it is emphatic. Paul says, no way. You do not keep singing so that grace may abound. You thank God for the grace that he has given you by you living a good life for him. That is how we show that we love God. That is how we show we're thankful for Him. That is how we show that we belong to Him. We walk like and talk like and look like Jesus Christ. That's it. It's as simple as that. And so he says the third thing, we've, we've selflessly loved, we've sac uh, sacredly lived, and now we let our light shine. We let our light shine. You walk 
as children of light. Verse nine for the verse nine for the fruit of light is found in all that is. Look, look at this. Three of them. We like threes, right? What is good? What is right? What is true? Who are those defined by? Not me. It's not defined by me. It's not defined by you. It's defined by God, right? What is good and right and true, that is defined by God. And so therefore he says, take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, and this is probably a hymn, maybe a hymn that is taken from the influence of Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 3 that we read a minute ago. This is a hymn that says, oh, they would have sang this in the first century. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Amen, right? That Christ will shine on us when we wake up, rise from the dead, and live for him. How do we do that? We give our life to Christ. And then we be the light. Now, this is not how we be the light. Not, not, not with a spotlight. You know, you know the, the spotlight you've seen? Uh, what are spotlights good for? They're good for when you want to when you want to spot something, right? They're good for when you want to you just you, know, you turn it off, you ride on the boat a little bit, you hear the the the, the frogs, and you, you turn it on to see what's over there, right? The spotlight's only good to turn on when you need it, right? But you don't have it on all the time. You just want a spotlight to to point something out. Oh, but Todd, it says expose. It says expose everything. Hold on now, that's not what Paul means. He don't mean carry your righteous, holier-than-thou spotlight around and go, hey, I got you. Everybody look over here. There's some sin. I'm going to expose this sin here, okay? And I'm going to tell you all about it so that, so that there's light on this. I exposed it, you know? Or even, even coming and saying, oh, look, look, look at here, you know? I'm not going to say anything, but I'm just going to shine the light and let everybody else see what's going on. You know, we're not to condemn people. We're not to act to walk around like we're, you know, a spotlight pointing out everybody else's wrongs. You know, if you were to halfway pull that plank out of your own eye, you'd realize how much that hurts. You'd be a little more loving and careful when you try to take the speck out of somebody else's. We're not a spotlight. We're a lighthouse. Constantly on, guiding the way, directing, showing what it looks like to love Jesus Christ. Not a spotlight. We're a lighthouse. How do you expose you don't expose by calling people out. And if you ever do need to call someone out, you do it in private. You do it one-on-one. -on -one. You do it lovingly and carefully, genuinely, sincerely. But we're not the spotlight trying to just expose them that way. Instead, we're a lighthouse. How do you expose? By being the light. If there's any darkness around light, do you see it? That's a silly question, isn't it? I mean, do you see darkness around the light? No. Just be the light. Be the light. We're going to have an opportunity in just a minute to, to, to partake in the Lord's Supper. And before we do that, I, and as we go into this time of, of invitation, opportunity for you to respond to less, I, I want you to ask yourself a question this morning. You know, this might seem like a negative lesson, but I don't want you to look at it negatively. I just want you to look at the parameters in which God defines that we should live to be, to be like Christ, to walk in the light, to let our light shine. And I want you to look at it and I want you to say this, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I no longer have to live in that. That I no longer have to live that way, but that instead I can live in the light. I want you to ask this question of yourself. How much light are you showing on a daily basis? How much light are you showing in the situations that you find yourself in every day? You know, whether it's around family or friends, around colleagues, even in the grocery stores, you know, I'm not suggesting that you go out there and, you know, you wear a shirt that says this little light of mine and you, you know, put your hand up and say, hey, I'm, I'm the light, everybody, I'm the light. If we're truly living out the Christian light, we don't even have to use our words to show it. We can just, people can see it by our actions. Do they, do they see your light for Christ by the way you act and behave? Do you turn it off and on? Or do you allow Christ to always shine through you? Do you walk in the light? Ron reminded us last week, when you walk in the light, what happens? You walk in the light just as he is in the light, and the blood of Christ continually cleanses you. And why do we do it? Not to be saved, 
but because we have been saved. Maybe you've been turning your light on and off. You need to repent. You want it to always shine. We've all been there. Invitations for you. Maybe, maybe you want to, maybe you want to put on that light today. Be baptized in Christ. We can do it. We'll do it. The doors do open right now. They do. And we'll do it. We want to. Give us a reason to open those doors because we are so desperately desiring for you to give your life to Christ. It's the best life I've ever lived. If you have a need, whatever the need may be, come while together we stand and sing. There's a fountain.